So we go now to Silke. Hopefully she's making a faster presentation. What does it mean? I, I have, have not even started. <laughs> okay, so I will, uh, let's say, introduce our European Com uh, Commission project, which was uh, the development of a point of care microfluidic device for quantification. I need 15 minutes just for the title. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm talking faster. Um, for the quantification of chemotherapeutic drugs in the body, the, prob the, the idea is, let's say, to provide medical doctors with uh, therapeutic drug monitoring, which actually is not possible yet. You get a dose, but nobody knows during the treatment how high is the concentration of the drug in your blood. Uh, due to the fact that in chemotherapy, you're, sorry, you have a very small therapeutic window, the window between no effect and strong toxicity. Um, the idea is, okay, uh, it's okay, doesn't matter. Um, that uh, you have to uh, remain during the treatment in this small therapeutic window. While you are seeing toxic effects actually quite quickly, you don't see when you are underdosing the patient. And uh, for that reason, we developed the, the uh, let's say we tried to develop this device. Um, this is what I already said. Problem is that most of the technologies are laboratory, specialized laboratory based, which I now use for therapeutic drug monitoring, which means it's too expensive and usually people are not doing it after the drug is developed, which means the idea was, okay, let's have something which is fast, easy, handheld, and allows us to mo uh, monitor during the treatment the concentration, the actual concentration in the blood, allowing the medical doctor to adjust the dose to, let's say, the actual concentration, which is strongly metabolic, uh, metabolic, no, depending on the metabolic activity. Sorry. I need a coffee. Um, this is what I said, easy to handle. Uh, the idea was to make it cheap with deposable uh, parts, especially that the same, same handheld device can be used for measurement of different types of chemotherapeutic drugs. So the idea was to have a type of cassette which you induce when you want to uh, put, uh, when you want to measure irinotecan and which you remove and replace by a cassette which uh, you use for the measurement of whatever doxyrubicine. And um, this was the different modules which we actually identified. So we, we take the sample, we have to separate the blood from the plasma. Plasma is usually that one which is containing the drug. You don't want to measure the drugs which are in the cells, so you have to take care that the cells are not bursting and releasing the drug which is tra trapped inside. Then you are removing from the plasma your drug into usually a methanolic phase, and then we analyze the methanolic phase, uh, let's say, for the drug, and if possible, I'm sorry, there's an insect, uh, for, the, for the parental drug and for the metabolite. Um, so, what we did was we were suggesting to measure the concentration for four different systems. One was irinotecan, SN38. Irinotecan is the prodrug. SN38 is the drug you are interested in. It will be metabolized in the uh, liver, meaning that this uh, ratio is strongly metabolic dependent. Uh, then we have the system of doxorubicin, doxorubicinol. Doxorubicin is an intrinsically instable molecule which very quickly uh, degrades or um, changes to doxo, uh, doxorubicinol, uh, which is no longer efficient. So in this case, again, 
Then uh, uh, we suggested initially a system which is uh, for metotrexate. Then in the meantime, a much better system is already on the market, which makes no sense. So we changed to a new drug, which was uh, which are uh, for immunotherapy. They are antibody drugs, which we try to measure with our system. And then finally, we uh, focused on paclitaxel, hydroxypaclitaxel again. Uh, paclitaxel is the drug, hydroxypaclitaxel is the metabolite, which is much less efficient. And um, as you could see, the project is now in the final phase, so most of the modules are ready. We, uh, and this is, it actually, my, my pointer is not working. Um, the idea was, let's say we have for, for the separation always the same module. We have for the readout two systems which are depending if your molecule is fluorescent or not, which can be just by disconnecting one instrument, connecting the other optical fiber can be changed. And then we have, let's say, the real separation and, uh, and distinguishing part, uh, which is the detection, which is dependent on the drug you want to, to measure. And um, I will introduce here the, the, let's say, the idea that we would like to have a part which is binding, localizing on the nanoparticle, and uh, that the functional groups which are different in doxyrubicin, doxyrubicinol, is actually that one which is giving us the signal. Um, so we developed an initial nanoparticle system in which we created with two ligand in a self-assembly way uh, kind of cavities on the surface of a gold nanoparticle which is selective or for doxorubicin or for doxorubicinol. And then, and then we had a readout system which is on the basis of a liquid crystal system in which only loaded nanoparticles are entering, the non-loaded uh, particles are remaining in the meta uh, met metanolic phase. Um, for doxorubicin, we found that we have a more simple system, so we uh, abandoned a little bit the approach for doxorubicin. For irinotecan, the same story. There is a possibility to distinguish this two by, uh, let's say, advanced fl fluorescence techniques. So we focused uh, with the nanoparticle approach on developing nanoparticles for the for the distinction of dox, uh, of paclitaxel and hyd uh, six hydroxypaclitaxel, and in this case the idea was to use uh, molecular imprinting uh, polymers on the surface of nanoparticles for paclitaxel. So the diff no, oh, it's not working. The the difference are always that one in the red brown let's say uh, field. And uh, as you could see in these two systems, I don't know, it's working on my hand, but it's not working on the, on the, why now it's working on the screen, sorry. Hmm, okay. Um, it's, it's in this area. You see that there is a difference in hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity, and this was the idea, let's say, to distinguish. But at the end, it will not work because the difference is so small that at, at the end of the day, most probable, we will not be able to do this. So we thought, okay, let's do molecular imprinting. We are creating in presence of the uh, target molecule a type of uh, imprint in which the functional groups of our polymeric monomers of the polymeric system are um, connecting by hydrogen bonds to the target molecule. And uh, then you polymerize, so you are fixing the uh, cavity which has exactly the functional groups interacting with your target molecule. Then you remove the target molecule and you have nanoparticles which are able to selectively bind uh, paclitaxel or hydroxypaclitaxel. It was done in, on surfaces, not yet on nanoparticles, and we are actually in the phase of developing these particles and characterizing them. This is 
is, uh, let's say, something which is for the rest of the project. Then the second one was uh, that we continued actually on the methotrexate leukovarine uh, folic acid uh, system because for this selective binding on nanoparticles, it's one of the most interesting and most complicated system. If we can do this, I think we can uh, recognize everything because this is the differences. So you see that there are very, very small differences between folic acid and um, leukovarine and met methotrexate. Methotrexate is the drug. Leukovarine is the rescue drug because it's given in so high uh, concentrations that there's kidney damage. And usually with leukovarine, you can protect the kidney. This is one of the re reasons why they don't need real drug monitoring because they can avoid the side effects. And then leukovarine is uh, a natural molecule you find in blood. And the idea was let's distinguish all three of them. At a certain point, we, saw, uh, we, we realized that it's important possible to do this experimentally. So we move to uh, molecular modeling, modeling the binding pocket for these different types of molecules. And uh, in this case, we had a small ligand, which is supposed to be selective. And then, uh, let's say, two longer or lo longer ligands, which are supposed to create the cavity which is also given an increasing amount of selectivity. So on one hand, we have something which is recognizing and distinguishing between the three molecules. On the other hand, um, let's say we creating by the depth of the pocket and other interactions, we are creating a selectivity between the three molecules. It was good because initially we thought our perfect system will be the aromatic ligand because we have uh, uh, interactions here in terms of pi pi stacking with our drug molecules. The idea was that we have uh, um, uh, electrostatic interactions here and then in the base of the pocket that we have also interactions and we thought, okay, this will be highly selective for methotrexate. Luckily for us, we started with molecular modeling because this is what happened. I will be fast. So we modeled the, the or we simulated the system with the three nanometer gold nanoparticles and the two ligands. And um, what we found out was this, that the highest binding uh, constant was for folic acid and not for methotrexate. Then we tried to analyze, so we, we did the modeling and we, we took some selected snapshots. And uh, this is the binding of methotrexate, so we get three, sorry, we get three bindings, but uh, however, the, the best binding is actually that one for folic acid which is due to the fact that here we had an unexpected binding, which is increasing the selectivity more for folic acid, which means we have a system which now is selectively binding to folic acid and not so much to methotrexate, but this is not what we want. So we thought, okay, if we are opening up the system using a slightly bigger nanoparticle, perhaps it will do the job. Um, we changed to a five nanometer gold nanoparticle, same system, the same two ligands. Suddenly our system was no longer selective for folic acid, but for leukovarine still, no nanoparticle selective for methotrexate. And then we tried to model the whole system with a non-aromatic, sorry, I with, with a non-aromatic system, with a linear system, and a, actually a quite simple system, and whoop, suddenly we got med, uh, selectivity for methotrexate. Actually, now at the moment, we are in the phase to build up all these three different nanoparticle systems in order to confirm this uh, by experimental data. But uh, this is how you can avoid at least two or three years of useless nanoparticle preparation just by two months of uh, modeling. So the non-aromatic system seems for our system to be the best ligand as, let's say, a second ligand. The first ligand is quite selective and it's quite selective for methotrexate. So this seems to be fine. That's my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Silke. We have time for one quick question. No questions, so thank you very much. So we move forward.